So you and Dad had a really good friendship. Um, oh, it was awesome. How did y'all meet? Do you know that you would have never had your late model car had it not been for me? Really? You would have never had it. Never had it. We were sitting on the porch at my farm. He and I had been hunting. And uh, he said, these kids, man, these kids want everything. He said, you know, when I was growing up, Ralph Earnhardt said, if you want to race, get out there in the junkyard and get your stuff and put it together. And he said, I'm telling my kids the same thing. If they want to race, I said, but Dale, let me tell you something. When Ralph Earnhardt told you to get out in the junkyard and get your stuff and put it together and go racing, that's what he was doing. He was doing that. He was winning races. He wasn't driving for Richard Childers flying on the King Air and had a whole stable full of race cars. <laughs> yeah. And I said, it reminds me of a guy that uh, grew up poor. and He's a farmer, and he brings his little boy in the store, and he buys himself a Pepsi. And he don't buy one for that little boy. And he sits over and drinks that Pepsi, and that little boy just looks at him and lusting after that Pepsi, but he don't buy him one. Yeah. I said, that's what you're doing to your kids. And I said, you got to – boy, he looked at me, and for 10 solid minutes, he never said a word. It seemed like two hours. Yeah. But for 10 minutes, he never said a word. Next thing I know, he bought them all cars, fell around holler, and you, you were yeah. the beneficiary of a little talk we had on the porch at the farm in South Carolina. That's hilarious. <laughs> Holy crap, man. That is so good. It's what a great analogy, by the way. I know it's it. true. Just dangling it in front of the kids, right? There, well, man. he bought them the cars, and for what he told me, he said, uh, now you're on your own. You yeah. tear them up, you got to fix them. Yeah, that was true. <laughs> he did that, right? <laughs> so when did you and him uh, become friends? He was racing dirt at Metrolina. Tag on, way back then. Yep, and uh, Donnie Reeves. Yep. And uh, everybody said, you know, he likes to hunt. You need to hook up with him and take him hunting. Well, he was hunting with it at a place in Chester, South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And I hunted with an old uh, guy named Franco Hill, who was a nut. Uh, made the movie Stroker Ace. He was dad's secret yes. in Stroker Ace. Yeah. And Franco was just a comedian. Made jewelry out of quail droppings. Yes, you know, I remember uh, that. Uh, oh, yeah. yes. you know that story. Yes. Yes. When Hank Jr. was here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Dale, uh, I, I got him to go down to Franco's. That's where you killed your first deer, yes. by the way, on, on Franco's property. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he started hunting with me. And I'm going to tell you something about Dale Earnhardt Sr. that a lot of people didn't know. He was as good an outdoorsman as there was in the world. Uh, he was as good a deer hunter, the best tracker I've ever seen. I, I'm 70 years old now. I've hunted with thousands of people. I've tracked deer with hundreds of people, and no one could track a deer like Dale Earnhardt. What no you, one. What do you mean by that? He could see this little bitty speck of blood. He had an instinct for where that deer went, and he could just stay in one position, never go out in front and get ahead of himself, and rustle up the leaves. He would stay back, and he'd get really aggravated. If anybody knows anything about Dale Earnhardt, he ran everything. Yeah, he was in charge. He was in charge. (laughs) So you follow him. Don't you get out in front of him. But he was patient, and you'd think he wouldn't be. Of anybody, the first time I ever took him hunting, he stayed in a tree all day long. I know it. I could not believe that. I know it. Yep. It just like didn't get out at lunchtime. Did not get out. No, went in that tree before daylight and got down in the dark. And it was amazing. And that's that blew my pent, mind. That's before these penthouse tree stands and everything. Oh, yeah. No, this is on a little ladder stand that sure. ain't hardly big enough to get your hind end on. And right. he sits there all day long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, that amazed me. But the, he had that same patience in tracking. And he just had this tremendous instinct. It, it was He was really, really advanced in hunting. Yeah. Martin Truex Jr. will do that. He'll get in the stand in the morning and not come out. And I'm like, all right. I mean, I don't know. I got to get a sandwich. <laughs> but I, he uh, he would, you know, and I, I'm not telling you anything. You, you, you're, you, you know the time commitment it takes to be great at anything. But, uh, man, when season started, he was gone. Um, and – you know, Teresa was pretty stern and tough, and, and she had things she expected and depended on out of the relationship and the marriage. But Dad, when that season started to the end of deer season, if he wanted to be in a stand, he was going to go be in a stand. Um, she, she didn't like me at all. Uh, tr- <laughs> tr- I was uh, I was not uh, one of Teresa Earnhardt's fans, yeah. I can tell you that. Because so, you were the oh, one yeah, taking we were him hunting and fishing. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> We got a deer lease in Texas together, and uh, we have that deer lease. What was Encinio Ranch? 
It Where was, was it? Uh, Piloncia. Piloncia. Yeah, it was right out of Catula, Texas. Uh-huh. And uh, he and I had that ranch for uh, from 1986 until he passed away. Mm-hmm. And two months before he died, he and I sat by a campfire, and uh, we did a handshake deal. We had not been going together. He would always like to go right after the cup banquet. And I would always like to go. So that was around December 10th or somewhere in that neighborhood. And I'd always like to go in January, go right after Christmas. And he didn't like that. So we ended up not hunting together as much. Yeah. And so he had invited me that same year to go to Silver City, New Mexico, and elk hunt with him. So we'd spent the time up there. So he said, hey, we're going to the Piloncia together this year. So he went when I went in January. So two months before he died, I did a handshake deal that I would never go back to the ranch without him, and he would never go back without me. Yeah. So I left a truck. I left deer stands. As far as I know, he left an old Suburban at the Catula <laughs> Airport, and 15 years after his death, uh, Gene Naquin asked me one day, he said, is anybody ever going to come get that old Suburban? <laughs> I said, probably not. Wow. You left uh, it. It's we all left there. It. You kept your word. Yeah, never went back. That's Holy an amazing story. Smokes. Yeah, never went back. My gosh.